Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this lunch webinar today. Talk about the exciting project uh, that the Food Foundation is um, co-delivering with the University of Leeds on scaling out place-based food initiatives. So this project is really aiming to kind of extend the reach and impact of local food initiatives um, focusing on specifically community-led food initiatives like food hubs, banks, pantries, and social supermarkets, and looking at the ways how they can alleviate not only food insecurity, but also how they can contribute to the sustainability and local economic growth. So uh, my name is Letizia. I'm a local food policy lead at the Food Foundation, and I'm joined today by an amazing uh, group of academics and, and researchers from the University of Leeds and um, from whom we will hear in this first of the two series webinar, where we're going to be focusing on the methods and the initial insights of the project. And that will be followed by a second webinar in July, when we will share uh, the findings and the best practice case studies. So the way that we're going to run today, we're going to hear a bit from um, Effie just to set up the scene and introduce the project and the context. And then we'll pass on to uh, Rachel, who will be talking about the methods of data collection and some of the strategies that we've employed for gathering the data. And um, we'll finish with Gemma, who will give us uh, initial insights and findings from the engagement she has had so far. And uh, then we're going to look at the kind of next steps and the plans for the um, remaining time of the project. In terms of um, housekeeping, as I said, uh, please feel free to introduce yourself in chat. Um, we will have a Q&A time at the end. So if um, you have any questions, pop them there and I'll be monitoring them as we go along. Um, I think that's everything to start with. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass to Effie. Effie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Letizia, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really uh, grateful to be hosted here by the Food Foundation to present on our project. Um, we're working together. Um, I am Dr. Ek Papadiropoulou. I'm an associate professor from the School of um, Earth and Environment at the University of Leeds. I'm also an associate director of the Global Food and Environment Institute, and I'm the principal investigator of this project. Um, and I'm going to try to control this. Let's see if I can manage it. Oh, there we go. There's a bit of a delay, I'm afraid. Sorry, there we go. So the um, aim of today's um, webinar, as Letizia said, is to introduce this uh, research project we're working together and to discuss a little bit the methods um, that we are using um, and some of the initial findings that we are coming across. Nope, it does... Uh, Apologies for this. It's a little bit. There we go. So um, I'll start about um, a little bit on the background um, uh, for this project. So um, unfortunately, uh, food insecurity in the UK is quite high and is growing. According to the Food Foundation's data, 18% of UK households are food insecure. Uh, within those, we're talking about 4 million children uh, that live in these households. And this food insecurity is not felt um, in an equal way across different geographies and different groups, with the Northeast being affected uh, more severely, um, and also households uh, with children, ethnic minority groups, uh, people with disabilities or on benefit are uh, more likely to be food insecure. So in this context, it's taking a while to change the slides. I'm sorry, I don't know why there's this delay. And I'm going the wrong way. There we go. In this context, we have seen um, an increase in what we call place-based food initiatives in response to this growing food insecurity. And we use this as an umbrella term to cover lots of different organizations, mainly third sectors, so not-for-profit organizations that distribute food and connect people to, to food. So they could include things like food banks, social supermarkets, food pantries, community centers, or cooperative farms, and things like that. They do many activities, many do more than one of those, they have more than one of those identities. Um, in our previous um, project, they, nope, 
I'm still getting. There we go. In our previous um, stage of this project, we uh, looked at the different benefits that this type of initiatives bring to the communities and the food systems, and we have grouped them across four categories. So they do amazing, amazing work with very limited resources. So they help enhance the sustainability. So we're talking more environmental side of things by reducing food waste, by for example. Um, or reducing food miles, they support local economies as well, providing market access to small, medium sort of food businesses, they employ staff and some of them generate revenue. Um, they strengthen local food systems and um, promote healthier eating options, um, but also they improve the well-being of the members of the communities that they serve, both in the physical um, health, but also their the mental health and providing very important um, opportunities for, for social connection. There we go, thank you. Um, but then again, there we, there we go. Okay, and the aim of this project is since we identified all these wonderful things that they do, um, these initiatives, we wanted to look at how those benefits, that impact could be scaled up or out. So either increase the size of their activities, which sometimes that is quite limiting, some of these things don't work in big scale, or replicate mm -hmm. in other places, reach more people and increase their um, their impact. I seem to be having trouble moving the slides. So um, as Letitia said, this is a collaborative project between the University of Leeds and the Food Foundation. So from the Leeds team, there's myself, but also Dr. Rachel Oldroyd um, and Professor Michelle, Michelle Morris um, and Dr. Gemma Bridge, who's the, the, the main uh, researcher on the project across different departments from the university, bringing in different approaches, both from a very quantitative big data um, side of things, um, but also more in-depth uh, qualitative um, data. From the Food Foundation, we have um, Hannah Brisden and obviously Letizia, who's kindly chairing the, the meeting today, the, the webinar today. And we're working together. Ultimately, we want to achieve that third box here to influence policy and change things to um, enhance the impact that the um, food initiatives have. So we haven't got to that point yet, but that's where we are um, aiming to get to. So we are carrying out the project in a few steps. So we started with a rapid evidence review, seeing what the evidence is out there, both from a, a great literature, but also academic literature and practitioner views. And then we moved to identify which areas, geographically speaking, at a world level, uh, world level are the, the ones that are most affected by food insecurity for different reasons. And that Rachel will talk more about this in a minute, using CDSC's priority places <clears throat> for food index. And you know, Rachel, again, we'll go into a lot more detail into that. Once we identify the areas that are most in need, then within those areas, we'll look to identify specific food initiatives that are working um, on, on this on this area and try to pick a portfolio, so a diversity, some food pantries, some maybe food banks, some on the food growing side of things, um, and develop, produce those um, 10 best practice case studies to highlight the wonderful work that they do with recommendations on how this work could be scaled out or up. Um, and then we have a number of activities, a program of engagement really with policy and decision makers. And that's where uh, the Food Foundation is taking a lead on that, um, essentially to try to, to change um, the situation on the, on the ground. Uh, we have done the first three and we are working uh, at the moment, uh, we are developing those um, 10 best practice case studies. Um, so this is where we are at the moment and we thought it was an opportune moment to start sharing um, what we're doing uh, with the relevant actors. Um, and as Letizia said, we're going to have a full, uh, all the findings at the end of the project, which will be in July webinar to share that then. Still can't believe it. One before that. Oh, 
There we go. So today's webinar, I'll hand over. You'll be glad to hear somebody that has better control of the presentation slides, hopefully, um, to Rachel, who's going to talk about the first part of that process on identifying um, the most um, in need areas. Then uh, Rachel, um, sorry, Gemma will follow uh, with uh, talking a little bit more about the case studies and, and the uh, food initiatives we have contacted and we, are, we will contact and then talk a little bit about the next step. So with that, I'll hand over to uh, Rachel. I'll give up control so that somebody else with better control can have it. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm open to questions um, later. Thanks, Effie. Let's hope that um, I have better luck controlling the slides. Can you hear me OK? Perfect, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Effie, for that introduction. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my involvement in the project to date. Yeah, they are very slow, aren't they? Um, and that mainly was scoping high priority areas using the Priority Places for Food Index. So if you're not familiar with the Priority Places for Food Index, the PPFI, um, this is a composite index which attempts to capture multidimensional food insecurity risk at a neighbourhood level by combining data across the seven different domains that you can see on the screen. Um, now, if you are familiar with spatial data, when I say neighbourhoods, um, I'm talking about lower super output areas, um, but I will refer to those as neighbourhoods going forwards. So a bit of background, the PPFI was created by the Consumer Data Research Centre at the University of Leeds um, and the Consumer Rights Group, which, and it allows us to identify neighbourhoods which are most at risk of food insecurity um, so that we can tailor interventions um, and target interventions to those populations most in need. Um, PPI, PPFI has been used by various different organisations um, and charities to date. Um, most notably, it's underpinned which is Affordable Food for All campaign, which asks supermarkets to commit to a 10-point action plan um, to help consumers with the cost of living crisis. Um, so some of the benefits of that have been that two large supermarkets have actually extended their budget lines into their convenience stores because we know that convenience stores usually are um, more expensive than, than large retailers, but not everybody is able to, to access a supermarket. Um, so I'll quickly just go through the individual domains so you have a better idea of the, the data that's included here. So the first one is proximity to, to supermarket retail facilities. So this is the, the average distance from the neighbourhood to a large um, grocery store, a large supermarket or retailer, and also the count of those supermarkets within a one kilometre buffer of the, the neighbourhood. Um, the second domain, accessibility to supermarket retail facilities, this bill on uh, work that previous colleagues did in the Consumer Data Research Center, and it uses a, a spatial interaction model um, to look at the time taken to travel from the neighborhoods to the, the large supermarket uh, facilities, and also time taken to travel via public transport. Um, access to online deliveries is again uh, built on a variable that came out of the same work looking at eFood Desert um e-food deserts so this is looking at gaps in in online delivery provision and then the fourth one down proximity to non-supermarket food provision is where we've looked at distance to to markets and um, smaller retail stores such as convenience stores so those first four relate to physical access to food um provision and then the last three remit relate more to socioeconomic barriers to, to access. So socioeconomic barriers domain includes the index of multiple deprivation and also lack of car access. Um, fuel poverty includes households in, in fuel poverty and also prevalence of prepayment meters. Um, and then family food includes healthy start, voucher, uptake, um, distance to the nearest food bank, um, and also children in relative low income families. So that last variable, children in relative low income families, was a new um, a new variable that we've included in the, the latest version of the, the index, which was released earlier in the year. And we felt that, well, this replaced um, free school meal eligibility. And we felt like this was a better representation of children in need, um, given that we'd seen some region, regional inequalities in the way that free school meal eligibility um, is applied. 
So I'll try and swap. So the data across the so variables across seven different domains are then standardized or normalized, and they're assigned the, the following weights that you can see on screen. And then the final index provides um, a score of one to 10 um, for each neighborhood, depending on the, the risk of food insecurity. So one being the highest priority or the highest risk of food insecurity, um, and 10 being the lowest risk of food insecurity or, or the lowest priority. So you can download um, the the data, including the, the final domain score, but you can also look at the, the individual domain scores if you wish. Um, and I have put a link to the, the dashboard at the end of the slides, but go and have a look at, our, at the interactive dashboard um, as well. So this allows you to, to zoom into your specific area. You can filter by different deciles, um, uh, toggle supermarket locations and things like that. So for this specific project, um, we looked at a slightly larger geography. So we looked at award level geography and we wanted to really capture um, a diverse range of areas and therefore a diverse range of food initiatives within those areas. So we looked at the final um, combined PPFI index score, but we also looked at the individual domain scores. Um, and as I said, we looked at a slightly different geography, so a slightly bigger geography than the neighborhood area. So what we did was we calculated the percentage of the ward, which was high priority. So those neighborhoods which were decile one or two. Um, and then we looked further at those wards where over 80% um, of the ward was high priority. So again, decile one or two. And also where they had a higher number um, of neighborhoods within them. So where the total number of neighborhoods were was over a specific threshold. So for England and Wales, this was um, 10, and for Wales and Northern Ireland, this was five. So then for each of the individual domains, we had a number of wards um, which met that criteria. And then we also looked at kind of wards which were um, frequently occurring across the different domains as well. <clears throat> So I won't go through each of the kind of individual um, the results in, in detail, but we ended up with a short list um, for each of the, the four nations. So England, Scotland, Wales um, and Northern Ireland. And it, it looked something like this. So we had the, the ward name. For, so, for example, Alan Rock, uh, the local authority areas such as Birmingham, how many neighbourhoods actually fell within the ward and then um, the percentage range that were high priority so this was across the different domains which is why we have the range here um, and then we we looked at the um the high priority domain so we could see um not only if it was high priority for the combined decile but if it was high priority um in in one of the specific deciles so so what was the reason for food insecurity risk in that specific area so these are the results for england and Wales um, and Scotland. And then I've included um, Northern Ireland, but this is um, currently work in progress. So we have a slightly different geography for, for Northern Ireland and it doesn't quite align. Um, so the neighbors don't quite align to, to ward level. Um, and we were a little bit unsure as to whether we would include Northern Ireland um, as we only heard a few days ago um, that, that we will be visiting them. So I think just keep an eye on this space and hopefully we'll be able to update you with some results for, for Northern Ireland in um, the, the second seminar. So Northern Ireland is still a work in progress. So once we'd had the kind of shortlisted um, results, I, I pass this over to, to Gemma, who was then able to um, locate specific food initiatives within those areas. And we also put together um, a kind of profile for each of the areas, which gave us a little bit more information about the, the type of people living there um, and the type of area that it was, which just gave us a little bit more context. Um, so I think I will pass over to Gemma, who will talk to you a little bit more about um, the site visits that she's done. Hopefully you've got control, Gemma.
Okay, so um, hopefully that's <laughs> perfect. Okay, so yeah, so I'll also be speaking about um, the actual visiting of the place-based food initiatives in each location. So as Rachel mentioned, um, using the data to identify the specific um, priority places, we um, we identified those uh, a, a range of priority, um, sorry, of place-based food initiatives within those priority places. Some areas didn't have a uh, like a food hub or pl um, a place-based food initiative within that specific area. So we went as close as possible, ideally within walking distance. I then reached out to each of the organizations in that locality um, to gauge their interest and to see if they would be willing to take part in the project. Um, for those that were, arranged a preliminary call to discuss the project and to explain their involvement. During that call, we identified a date for the visit. I carried out the visit. And during that visit, um, we um, we spoke about the, the project they were running or the, the initiative they were running, the range of, of activities that they offer, the, the different populations that access the services or that engage in that, in that project, um, and also spoke about some of the challenges, weaknesses, strengths, and opportunities that that organization is facing. Um, and then following that visit, I compiled that into a uh, into a case study document and also used the the toolkit that we produced in our previous in our previous project the links for for the both the case studies examples from the previous project and the evaluation toolkit are available at the end of this presentation um but during this project I worked with the different organizations I visited to develop a case study and undertake an evaluation to identify the range of benefits that they offer within their communities in the wider food system and then each of the food initiatives that were involved were paid um, 400 pounds to cover the costs of their time and involvement in the project. We were keen to make sure that they weren't going to be losing out by taking part. And also hopefully that that, that money there would, would enable them to continue offering some of those services. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so um, this is a, a take on the slide that Rachel shared. Um, so this is for England, and these are the organisation areas that we visited. So based on the priority places, um, the ward at the ward level, um, I went through and identified different place-based food initiatives, and these are the organisations that I visited in England. So as the aim of the project is to try and get that diverse um, spread of different organizations in different areas working with different people um, that was the aim of making sure that we could do that across England Wales Scotland and Northern Ireland so for example in England I visited large organizations such as the Active Wellbeing Society in, in Birmingham so they're a community benefit society and they work across Birmingham with lots of different people offering lots of different activities all with the food as a, as a focus, um, but they also offer activities such as walking, bike riding, um, cooking, composting. So they have a range of different activities that they offer and their aim is to support the communities they work with to live active and connected lives. Um, and then and then as a kind of contrast to that, went to Burn Grieve in Sheffield. So that's a, a food bank. They're part of the Trust or Trust network and they provide three days um, of emergency food to families and, and individuals within that area. Um, and they're part of, as I said, that Trust or Trust network. So their primary goal is to support people who are in absolute crisis with food. Um, but they also work as part of a wider, a wider network of organisations across Sheffield to signpost individuals and families on to support them to make the step beyond um, from that emergency provision onto a more sustainable source of food and support with finance, financial advice and things like that. Um, so, and then for, so this is just a map to show those different areas. So I visited all of these across the last couple of weeks. Um, making the, the trip by train and bike, which has been really interesting for me in terms of to see how, how I can get around, how I can access the different organisations. It also enables me to kind of experience the place. Um, so getting from the train to that location, these organisations aren't all kind of city centre locations. So for example, um, visiting in, in Nottingham, that was like a three miles outside of the city centre, but it was one of the only organisations that people can access living outside of the Nottingham city centre. So 
that was interesting. Um, and again, in Birmingham, it was similar um, to, to see that organization. Okay. Perfect. Okay. And then this is Wales and Scotland. So um, as Rachel mentioned before, we identified the places in Wales and Scotland. Um, Wales is yet to be visited, but that is um, a small community centre that has recently been taken over by a charitable group, but they have the aim of supporting communities access affordable food and services. Um, the Isle of Butte was an interesting case because um, they are pretty much the only charity offering support across the island. And they offer a very wide variety of services and support. So it's employability skills. They have a large farm that they support um, people to access food with. They have a shared bike scheme. They also support with housing and they recycle furniture. Um, and their aim is to support the island to become the first zero waste circular economy island, um, I think, in the world. But um, they are on, on the way to do that. But at the moment they they have some challenges with getting getting support and services in so yeah so it's been very interesting to see all of the different locations as rachel said northern ireland is a work in progress but we are in conversation with arranging a visit to northern ireland um so that will be added and discussed in our in our follow-on um webinar in july um and the aim of the project, we're going to hopefully compile all of the insights that we've got um, into a, a larger report and share that so that we can share the, the different learnings, so we can share the ways that different organisations are overcoming some of the challenges um, and opportunities that they've, they've mentioned, um, as well as highlighting the range of... Um, different benefits. So this is the just an example of the locations in Wales and Scotland to try and highlight the diversity of places we've been. Um, oh, it's going slightly crazy. Um, so this is the the toolkit that I've mentioned that we will have worked with the each of the food organisations with. Um, so it was developed during the project that we did in Leeds with 10 different organisations. Well, we actually worked with 36 different organisations to develop it. Um, and the tool itself offers the organisations with an ability to identify the range of benefits they have um, and monitor the impact. So it offers a way for them to use a PDF or an Excel uh, document that they can come back to, that they can use for funding bids, um, that can be used for them to, to identify any strengths and weaknesses they have and also to identify areas where they're making really big change in their communities. Okay, and this is just some of the pictures that um from the different organizations I've been to visit. Um, so as I mentioned during the visits, we capture evidence um of the range of benefits that they have. So this shows the diversity of organizations. So Fine Futures is in the Isle of Wight. Um, sorry, the Isle of Wight, so it's the Isle of Butte. Um and there their focus, sorry, their focus is on supporting people to develop skills. One of the ways they do that is through a community farm. Um, and during COVID, they were one of the organisations that supported people to access fresh food because during for a time, um, even their one supermarket on the island was closed. So the only way that people could access food was, was through them um, and obviously any dry products that they had already in their cupboards. Um, and then, yeah, the other organisations um, offer several different methods so we've got food banks social supermarkets um community farms uh and various food provision a lot of the organizations offer food at all of the activities that they offer so whether that's um a food bank or whether that's a community cafe um to enable people to access food and to ensure that that isn't the only um that isn't a barrier to them um to access um, and so in terms of the next steps, um, we're going to be working with the different organisations to produce those spotlight documents, which will highlight the range of benefits they're having, their strengths, their weaknesses, and any recommendations that we have worked with them on to about how they could scale out or up their impact. Um, we'll also, the Food Foundation will work with us to map relevant policy and decision makers that we can share these insights with and carry out a programme of engagement. 
Um, we'll also incorporate these findings into various campaigns, initiatives and publications to support those organisations you worked with, as well as others across the UK, um, to support them to access funding, to continue their work or to identify ways that they can scale up or out their impacts. And we'll also be following up with another webinar in July where we'll be sharing those recommendations and insights with you then. Oh, I can't share the next screen. Perfect, there we go, awesome. Okay, Um. so yes, thank you very much. I will pass back to Leticia who will manage the questions. Hi, sorry, can you hear me all? Yeah, good, great. Um, so I'm just gonna pass on to the next, or move to the next slide. So there is a number of links here um, that we can share in the chat as well. Um, I can't see any questions in the Q&A, um, but if anyone, we're a relatively small group, so if anyone would like to um, raise their hand and just come on and ask a question verbally, um, that's also okay. Or um, if there's any questions that you have thought of that you would like to pop into chat, um, now is the time to... Um, so maybe Leticia, while um, people are gathering the thoughts, something to, to mention in terms of what we have just presented. One of the things that makes us very excited um, is the, the fact in this, the, the approach to this project and how we are trying to, it's quite innovative in that sense, how we are trying to combine more quantitative large data sets um, coming from our CDSC's work, previous work, um, that give us an idea of uh, big trends on food insecurity and the reasons behind it and drill down into a bit more um, detail on how, you know, what's the specific context, um, what are the barriers or the opportunities for scaling up or out with those more qualitative um, type of methods that Gemma was talking about and combine these two different approaches. I think it gives us a really interesting, um, more comprehensive approach to trying to um, yeah, to, to approach, I guess, that those type of co uh, complex challenges that, that that we are facing. So that's something that gets us very excited. And I know at this point, we're just presenting the methods and a little bit of a hint of what, what that is to come, but uh, we have some really exciting um, data coming through and hopefully um, in July, we'll have some more uh, you know, meaty recommendations. And yes, please, everybody feel free to um, use the links that we have uh, provided on the slide here and in the chat. I think we have shared that to follow up and look into more detail. Sorry. We have, yeah, we have also been um, recording the this webinar. So we will be sharing that um, on our uh, YouTube channel. And uh, if there's any further questions or follow-ups, we'll, we'll put all of the um notes and uh, the slides as well for you to be able to access them. Um, we have one question from Jill. Um, so Jill is asking, she's from Glasgow Food Policy Partnership. Hi Jill. And um, she's asking um, if there is a particular reason why Glasgow City doesn't seem to have been populated. Do you want to take that, Rachel? Yeah, sure. Um, I think the default view on Priority Places when you open it initially um, just shows you decile one. So it might be a case of that you, you might need to turn on deciles one, two, you know, the, uh, the later ones as well. Um, but it also might be that if you have a look at the different domains, uh, it might be that uh, Glasgow isn't particularly high priority for the overall combined index, but when you um, drill down to the separate domains, it might be that you find some specific areas um, that are food uh, or at risk of food insecurity uh, in the different domains as well. Oh, I think, yeah, that's great. But let me know if you have any, any further questions about that, Jill, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, um, Rachel. We have now a few questions in the Q&A. So I'm just going to um, read those out. So 
we um, have a question from Caroline about the toolkit for food hubs and the impact evaluation. I think we also have the link to that. So I will just pop that in the chat um, whilst you answer that. Do you want to come in on that, Gemma? Yeah, sure. I can answer that. Yeah. So we developed this toolkit with um, food hubs in Leeds in the previous kind of phase of the project. And it was in response to a lot of the food hubs or place-based food initiatives um, explaining that one of their biggest challenges is accessing funding and the time needed to kind of capture that impact every time they write a funding bid. So the aim of the toolkit is to provide a place where insights can be shared, where organisations can monitor the number of people attending, um, the number of, for example, the number of food parcels shared, the amount, the volume or the amount of produce grown, the number of people involved in different initiatives, but also to try and um, stimulate the thought and consideration about the, the shifting toward more sustainable approach. So can the organisation consider local produce? Can the organisation consider supporting people with recipes to use fresh local produce? Um, as well as trying to capture evidence beyond those numbers. So to capture evidence around kind of the stories of the people attending the different sessions. Can you capture quotes or photos or, or pictures? Could drawings be taken, um, be made about the different activities? So that toolkit is there and it's a free resource. So it's available on the on the link shared for organisations to use, um, to capture and monitor their impacts and to use to support them to access funding um, and to highlight their range of benefits within their communities. Hopefully that answers that question. Um, Letizia, unfortunately you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Effie. And thank you, Gemma. And the next question maybe, Effie, you can take it. Uh, think about how um, we have thought about and have we thought about how we'll approach developing advice on on scaling out and the work that we've um, we've done um, to basically get this project off the ground, what was the rationale? Yeah, no, that that's great. Thank you, Sue, for the for the question um, and for attending. And um, so we are still working out what those recommendations are going to be, obviously. But in terms of structuring that those recommendations and advice, I think the way that might be the most useful way is to think about who the audience for that advice or the recipients or the enablers, the actors that we are talking to, um, to make something, some change, the change. Um, so target maybe uh, the third sector organisations, what's the advice to them, how they can do things, maybe this type of organisations involved, um, local authority level policy makers, but obviously working for more long-term change um, with more national level um, policy makers. So I think we're going to structure it according to those sort of levels of, um, you know, stratifying the, the food actors involved in, or actors involved in, in, in this topic. Um, but yes, yet to be defined. Thank you. And maybe if I can um, just uh, jump in. So in my role as a, um, like food policy, they work very closely with Birmingham City Council and their food partnership. So um, we have the new food system strategy that is structured across a number of different work streams uh, and action groups. I think that'd be a really good route into um, thinking about what funding opportunities exist and how the local authorities can um, prioritize some of um and they've always kind of looked at the evidence and the priority projects. And I think depending on the on, on the evidence from this project, I think that would really help in um, putting that business case for why um, we could support uh, support this scaling out across the city. OK, and then we have another question from Xavier. Um, He's asking if there's a plan to look at how food organizations can generate more food on a day-to-day -day basis. And does that come uh, later in the study or is there a plan for a separate study? Is that um, something that, uh, Rachel, you want to take on? I might pass this one over to Effie if she's yeah. happy to. Yeah, I'm <laughs> happy to take it to whoever. Yeah. 
I can I can start and then Effie can jump in, I think it's probably. So I think in terms of, of this question, one of the questions or one of the discussion points that we've been having with the organisations we've been working with is some of their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. For some organisations, access to food is not a challenge. For others, it's a real struggle. So hopefully from the conversations and the case studies that we're producing, we'll be able to share that that kind of knowledge and expertise and experience between different organizations um, which will support those organizations struggling to access food or needing to increase their the volume of food that they have whilst also being able to support those organizations that are existing in terms of having that access to food in a in a strong way so I think that will be a a way of helping those organizations but I do think there's a scope for further research looking at how organizations access food, where that food comes from, where the organizations are supplying food, getting their food from, and how sustainable that is in the longer term. Effie, did you have anything to add to that? Yes, um, thank you, Gemma. I think just to add, in case um, we're talking more about food growing type of organizations like community supported schemes, things like that. So one of the recommendations obviously there to produce more food would be um, land availability. So that's one of the things that we've seen as a bit of a barrier across this type of organizations and in the recommendations. We're going to be looking at how can we make land more available and good land more available to local growers and this type of scheme so that they can grow more and um, produce more you know uh, food affordable and, and healthy and culturally appropriate food uh, for the local communities um yeah so i would say when we're talking about that um that's a, a, a part of, of the answer so, but this question also prompted me to say something that within this project, in our previous work, um, we are, um, there's a tension here between growing, if that makes sense, this type of wonderful, wonderfully impactful work, um, um, but also while doing that to recognise the need for fundamental change to, um, in other parts of society and, and structural sort of inequalities that lead to people being food insecure. So we all are always aware that, and, and the organization themselves tells us exactly the same, that they want to move away from this emergency food provision or responding to this um, really bad food insecurity situation where we are in at the moment and um, more providing more holistic services rather than just um, patching, you know, um, gaps that we're facing at, at the moment, big problems. So always looking at the fundamental uh, reasons, the root causes of this food insecurity. Once those are, are tackled, you know, we, we won't be having these conversations and we'll be all talking about um, other wonderful things. So uh, always balancing that need for growing, doing more of this wonderful work, but also recognising that we need to work at the uh, fundamental roots of food insecurity as well. That's all. Yeah. I'll just jump. I'll yeah. jump back in as well, if that's okay. Um, it's in its very early stages, but we we do have a project starting um at Leeds now, looking at food redistribution as well. So um. Obviously, it's not creation of new food, but a potential solution is is redistributing food um, that is good to eat, that would normally go to waste. Um, and we are using the priority places for food index to ensure or to, to inform those food redistribution networks um, to ensure that people in need um, you know, are getting uh, redistributed food or that it could be maybe redistributed in a better way. So I guess it's not yeah, creation of new food, but that is a potential solution as well. And that's something that we are looking at um, in Leeds in a, a current project. Great. Um, thank you, Rachel. Um, I think we have one more question from Caroline. Um, around looking at nutrition related issues within this research and whether that is something that's being considered, um, for example, dietary diversity and nutri nutrition, but nutritional value of the food that is being provided in these settings. Um, is that something that um, Gemma, you want to take on? Yeah. Well, I can take it and then Effie I think you can probably jump back in um so one of the aspects of the the evaluation tool is asking about access to healthy and nutritious local food so that is um trying to gain a better understanding of the types of food that people are accessing and also the programs of support that are in place to support people to access 
healthy local food. So cooking classes, food growing, um, whether children have access to fresh fruit and vegetables within that space um, and those type of questions. So in terms of, of that for this project, that's the kind of focus. Um, and also we're interested to see if there's access to culturally diverse um, and culturally appropriate foods for different communities, especially in those areas where there's a high diversity of people from various different countries and various different backgrounds. Um, because typically a lot of the food that is shared with food banks is very British in focus. Mm -hmm. So baked beans and bread and pasta, um, but there's less um, food for people with different dietary needs or different dietary preferences. So that's the the focus. But I do think there's scope and I don't know if there's research being done elsewhere, looking at the specific um, dietary and nutrition, nutritional value of the specific food provided especially from food banks. But I think there's also a need to consider the fact that food banks are providing emergency food. So it's for people that literally have very, very little other choice. Um, so I think the bigger focus is on those organisations that are working with people to learn and develop their food literacy skills around cooking, um, access to fresh food, how to cook that food, accessing kind of the equipment to be able to cook that food. And that is what we're looking at in this project. Effie, did you have anything to add to any of that? No, I think that's spot on. But Caroline, that's a really big, um, a very important question and a big struggle. I think with all of these organisations, they have to deal with uh, whatever they get or whatever they can grow. So that is, um, I guess it will be the next step on not just looking at feeding people, but, you know, feeding people really nutritional and culturally appropriate food and, and all that. So we're not focusing, we're not doing a, a dietary, you know, nutritional value type of assessment, but that would be really interesting. Yes, in the future, maybe. Great. Um, thank you, Effie. I also actually have a follow up question. Is not, It was not a regular question, but something that caught my eye and uh, was around the opportunities and, and whether that is um, something that any of the um, organizations that you visited have considered to make it more sustainable around um, bulk buying and actually uh, supporting the kind of whole food system. So not just relying on the surplus food being donated, but looking at models to kind of transition to actually purchasing some of that food and um, rewarding the local farmers and, and supporting the whole food system. You know, whether I'm um, Gemma again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um... Yes. Yeah, so some of the food um, organizations, so the ones that are offering food banks, it seems that, that they are relying wholly on kind of fair share, um, too good to go type organizations providing food redistributed that's surplus. A lot of them are buying in kind of additional um, important items is how they would describe it. So pasta, rice, bread, cereal, things that are like the basis of a meal. Um, because often that's, there's not enough or there's not regularly enough to meet the need that they um, are trying to deliver to. The other organisations that are moving for, moving away from a kind of emergency and more towards a more sustainable approach, they are either growing their own food or they're buying from local producers. So the organisation Pulp Friction in Nottingham, um, they provide support for people with learning disabilities and or autism. Um, and they grow their own food. They purchase food from local supermarkets and use um, kind of the, the Trust or Trust network to access food that's, that's surplus. So they're using food from various different sources. And they've also, um, as well as offering support for people who are who are financially insecure, who have food insecurity issues, they also um, cook surplus food for the local food, fire and police station using um that surplus food using food that they've grown and also supporting the the local community with people who have learning disabilities and autism to cook that food so they are kind of doing all sorts of things across the food system and wider community to supply food to support people to develop food literacy skills and also to ensure that local businesses have access to food and can use that food in a sustainable way great Thank you, um, Gemma. I think uh, unless there's any further questions in the chat, um, I think that um, leads us to the 
end of this webinar. As I said, um, this is the first of the two webinars that we are planning to deliver. Uh, the next one will share the you know, full findings of the best practice case studies, and that um, was going to probably be scheduled in mid-July. Um, we will we'll obviously, as I said, uh, post this webinar as well on our YouTube channel and um, share all of the links as well in the notes. So thank you so much for joining us. Hopefully this was insightful and um, helpful and that you are going to kind of look at some of these tools and resources in your own localities and settings and how they can be um, applied for um, improving some of those outcomes of the organizations that you work with. Thank you all for joining us and um, for this lunch hour. And I will be seeing you in July.